Hidden in the mists of the South Pacific, on one of the most remote islands on Earth, is a mystery locked in stone. Giant human forms stand against the weathering of time. These are the mute sentinels of Easter Island, stone statues called Moai. Roughly 900 Moai were carved over a period of 500 years, hewn with stone tools from the volcanic rock of an ancient crater. No one knows how the many-ton statues came to stand at their sacred sites. How could an isolated culture with only the simplest tools move monoliths from the quarry to sacred platform sites scattered all over the island, some of them five miles away? Legend says the statues magically walked to their venerated platforms. To penetrate beyond the myths, Nova assembles a team of archaeologists, engineers, and the Easter Islanders themselves. Together, they launch a series of hands-on experiments to explore the methods used by the ancients. But no one anticipates the events that unfold. We want to go little by little. Ideas clash. No, and I go for by the study because no. the angle is different. Tensions escalate as new methods are presented. I've got 12 people moving six times. You, you didn't do that. People? That's 65? Yes. No way. Resources run out, just as they did in ancient times. What are we going to do, fight over it? This is the legacy of Easter Island, a culture that exhausted itself in moving giant stone. How did this ancient society achieve such monolithic greatness, and why? Did it fall? Around 400 AD, Polynesian voyagers set out across the open sea in search of new land. It is believed they sailed a large double canoe made of wood and rope lashings. Their journey took them thousands of miles across the Pacific until, by chance, they came upon the rugged coastline of a solitary, uninhabited island. Easter Island, now known as Rapa Nui. Today, treeless, windswept land rises from an infinite sea. Just seven miles across, Easter Island is studded with volcanic craters which provide the raw material for the stone sculptures of the past. For 1,200 years, the island culture thrived in isolation. The population may have reached as much as 10,000. It was a closed society. As far as is known, nobody came to the island, and nobody ever left. There was no recorded history. And all that remains is a thin thread of oral tradition that has passed down through generations. We do know the ancient islanders feverishly expressed themselves in stone. According to island folklore, the Moai are the spirits of powerful ancestors. They were raised on platforms called Ahu, which were the centers for ancestral worship among the island's clans. But as population grew on the tiny island, conflict erupted between the clans. Food and timber were scarce. 
the people stripped the landscape of its once abundant trees. Today, only thin soils and exposed pastures survive. Could it be that this remote civilization ultimately destroyed itself over the moving and raising of their sacred moai? For decades, theorists have come to the island to try their hand at moving moai. In 1955, Norwegian archaeologist Tor Heyerdahl tried to drag a nine-ton moai on a small tree fork over the ground. The pulling method worked but dragging a heavy statue is likely to damage the carved stone. Heyerdahl returned in 1986, inspired by Rapa Nui folklore. Legends say that the human statues walked across the island to their Ahu platforms through a spiritual power called mana. Heyerdahl tried walking the nine-ton statue by rocking it forward like a refrigerator. Although it works, the method is precarious on anything but level terrain. Thousands of tourists come to gaze upon the stone giants and wonder how the Rapa Nui people moved and erected them. Dr. Claudio Cristino has been Easter Island's resident archaeologist for the past 20 years. He takes Wyoming architect Vince Lee to the largest ahu on the island. It was one of the ceremonial centers on the east coast. In 1960, a tidal wave struck the ahu and washed the 15 massive moai inland. Claudio was in charge of restoring the site. Yeah. The statue was broken, was decapitated. I see. And just the head was 27 tons. The head alone? Just the head. And, and, and you had to put it back on and cement them together somehow? Yeah. Would, no. Vince's expertise is Inca stonework. He has explored how the Incas moved heavy stones and is intrigued by Rapa Nui ingenuity. Is this more like the finish that they had when they were first made? In other words, most I mean, of them that you see now more are... Like, like, like here. Oh, I see. Very smooth. Yeah, yeah. sure. That's quite well preserved. And all of this is erosion due to, erosion. The, to, yes. to weather over the years. They're, they vary in size, but this, this one here at the top knot's got to be pretty big. How many tons is that? 65 tons. Wow. And is that how you erected these, with a crane? With a crane. With a crane, with 50 people, with ramps, with poles, with <laughs> levers. So this gave us, for the first time, a quite clear idea of the incredible energy that was used I, in the past. Even with it. modern equipment, it yeah. sounds like it was a huge project. Even Vince and Claudio have trouble imagining how an ancient culture could have carved, transported, and erected such mighty stones without the aid of modern technology. The meaning of the Moai to me as an outsider to this island and to this culture is ancestor. It's the link with the past. The meaning of the Moai is family. Archaeologist Joanne Van Tilburg is here to test her theory of how the Moai were moved. For 15 years, she has searched for the cultural significance encoded in the Moai. When Rapa Nui people look at these statues and think about these statues, they are to them as if they are indeed living beings. But with no written record left behind and only limited clues from archaeology, the question of how the Easter Islanders moved their Moai remains elusive. Science and mysticism, religion, faith, um, archaeology, engineering, all of these things are trying to come together here to understand what, when you look at it, is a relatively simple object. It's big, there's no question about that, but it's so beautifully designed in its simplicity that it offers us the possibility of answer, and yet the answer is so deeply embedded in the culture, and much of that answer, unfortunately, has been lost. Joanne has measured the height, width, and estimated weight of each Moai on Easter Island. 
Her inventory of measurements created a digital model of a statistically average Moai. And so the computer data helps Joanne and robotics expert Zvi Schiller formulate their theory on how the ancients moved the statues. Uh, how turns out there was some mistake God, there. But, uh, so this is this By digitizing a topographical map of Easter Island, Zvi simulates the undulating terrain. This virtual fly-through shows them a view of the island from the perspective of a moai in transit. Over What's up? and What's down. down. This, ah. is, this is where we actually, this is the new part. Mm -hmm. and, uh, from this digital model, a full-scale replica will be made for experiments on the island. Joanne proposes laying the statue on a triangular-shaped sled and then pulling the moai and sled over logs that roll along wood tracks. It's safe for the statue, it's comfortable for the statue. Our team of experts has gathered on the island so to put their theories to the test. Legs. The best way to fit them is standing them up. They will first try Joanne's log roller method. Back and get it at another time. That's an option. So and the other thing, like, Claudio will be in charge of raising the Moai. And the people that study this culture for years know that any of these events was part of a very complex religious process exactly. that took years. I mean, Vince is the only member of the group who has explored how another ancient culture, the Incas, moved heavy stone. From a engineering standpoint, a triangle is the simplest. While engineers V. Schiller has simulated Moai transportation on his computer, he's here to see if his solutions will work in the real world. Rafael Rapu, a Rapa Nui sculptor, will be the foreman for the project. What's the height? We don't care. That's not important. That's not important. Joanne's architect husband, Jan, demonstrates Joanne's Moai moving method. Before we do that, the tracks are a little bit of a... A triangular A-frame sled will be placed on logs that will roll over rails. And then you just pull this forward, and when you run out of a roller, we're going to put another one there. You run out of a roller... They have their method. Now they need a Moai. A concrete mixture of sand and stone from the island is poured into a fiberglass mold scaled up from Joanne's digital model. It is as close as the team can get to using a moai without risking damage to an actual statue. Three days later, the nine and a half ton concrete moai is ready to be lifted out of its curing pit. And now. Even with the aid of a crane, the Moai is an unwieldy object. Chainsaw surgery frees the Moai from its fiberglass mask. From a digital computer image to a concrete facsimile, this Moai is the culmination of years of Joanne's research. People call me the mother of the Moai, and right now I feel very fond of that object. So I can see how people would invest family histories and family traditions in something like this. It's, it's very easy to do. More than half of Easter Island's Moai are still at the quarry, known as Rano Raraku. It is a mountain of hardened volcanic ash. Here the Moai lie in various stages of production. Some half carved, some on their backs as if sliding down the quarry slope, and others buried from carving debris and erosion.
Raphael Rapu comes from a long line of Rapa Nui carvers. He takes local sculptor Santi Hito to the high slopes of the quarry to explain the techniques used by the ancient carvers. They sculpted Moai from the bedrock using a stone tool called a toki. The largest Moai on the island, named El Gigante, the giant, was never finished. Its partially carved figure provides a glimpse into how the Moai were carved. Continuing the tradition of Rapa Nui master carvers, Raphael passes on the oral history to Santi. Uh, his word came from the elder people when he was a young boy. And so it transcends from them to him, as is right now, like you can you know, uh, witness how it transcends to me. And, hopefully eventually to my kids and so forth. Raphael explains that first, channels were carved around the body of a moai. Well, he thinks that 20 people carved this moai over a period of time of five to six years to this stage. This is our sections of people who were, you know, given you know, as your assignment. This is your section. You can carve, and you can see different, you know, ways of doing it. And you can clearly see the talking marks and and how the people were carving and going in and make these deep cuts in the rock like this, that. The channels reached around and eventually formed a boat-like keel until the statue could be snapped off and fully extracted. This quarry was established around 900 or 1000 AD. And for a period of at least 500 years, maybe a little bit more, most of the statues that we know about were made. Well, this is a large statue of over 100 tons. This massive statue was in the process of being moved downhill. It's already detached from, from the mother rock, and it's extracted from the quarry, and it will end at the foot of the hill into a prepare hole to put it in a vertical position. This monstrous monolith needed certainly hundreds of people to move them downhill to transport them to distant sites all along the coast of the island. At the base of the quarry slope, the moai were erected in prepared holes so the carving could be finished. Immediately coming out of the quarry, they came down to prepare a hole, and you can see here the remains of the keel. The main purpose to put the statues in this hole was to finish this section, and they built a very sophisticated uh, wooden frame that was attached to the statue while standing, then probably use a, using soil, dirt, this debris from the carving process, they build the mounds and the ramps to move it down slope. So actually, the statue will go face down, head first on top of the rig, and we start moving on these several roads along the coast of the island. The replica Moai is brought in by truck and crane to the transport site. A traditional Polynesian ceremony called an Umu Tahu is held. The priest's blessing acknowledges that working around a multi-ton statue can be dangerous. So it's a benediction for, on behalf of the Catholic Church and this community for this project and the work that they're doing here to take care of everyone. Joanne's A-frame sled is ready for the Moai. Its unique triangular shape is proportioned exactly for the statue. The team will try to pull the entire rig 100 yards on flat terrain using Joanne's log roller system. The log should roll over this track of thin wood rails. 
Hey, we're going to move it. Stop we're going to move it. Five meters. And then stop. And then we're going to regroup, talk about it a little bit, and then we're going to move it. Probably we'll move it to the end of the rollers, and that's the first day. So. Oh, yeah. Joanne confers with Nico Hawa, who is in charge of the Rapid Nui pulling team. He rehearses his commands before they begin. No, you go hard, hard, they got the commands. Okay. <laughs> We're pulling on terrain that's flat as a pancake here, and that's the easiest situation. That's where I'd start out, too, to test the idea. But if it's got to be valid, it's got to be something that would work on going up hills and down hills and side hills and stuff like that. I think this system would be a little harder to do on that kind of terrain. But let's give them a chance and see what happens here. Surprisingly, the logs don't roll. They slide over the rails. Slide and then roll. It rolls a little bit. It rolls a little bit. It rolls first and then slide, maybe. But it slid first. They're getting all these beams in place. They're all crooked. They're all bunched up. They slid more on one side, and they stopped completely on another side. I don't know why. But uh, they all, now they got them all straightened out. I think we're just about ready to go again. The rollers tend to move like this, and they get stuck. So you can imagine that they had a big problem if they were going, you know, like in a very steep slope, over 5%. That would be a real problem. We tried rolling. They didn't roll. They all slid. Four are bunched up here. Three are bunched up there. We're now going to lash them, so we simply make a sled out of it. Well, you could see what happened when they started moving their sled. Their rollers went crooked and got all jammed up underneath the sled, so they're going to have to re-rig. And actually, it's too bad, but it's not real surprising, because the use of rollers is one of those ideas that looks great on paper, but it's real hard to make it work in the real world. So what they've decided to do is pretty clever. They're going to take those rollers, and they're going to tie them to the bottom of the sled, fix them so that they can't roll anymore, but they also can't go crooked. The disadvantage is going to be, because they can't roll, there'll be more friction. But I think it's going to work better. So they'll lay it back on their rails with their moai, and then they'll just slide it down the rails. I think it'll work pretty well. The hardest part is overcoming the inertia of nine and a half tons. Then the sled slides easily. This novel solution exploits rope lashings and wood crossbeams that are common in traditional Polynesian culture. The people of the Pacific are intimately tied to the ocean. In ancient times, outrigger canoes were the vital link between islands. The outriggers have two beams that extend from the side of the canoe to prevent it from capsizing. The larger voyaging canoes were simply two hulls bound together by wood crossbeams and rope lashings. Joanne's theory is that the same seagoing technology was used for transporting moai across land. If you look down the length of this transport rig, you will see the strong triangular shape that we've created. And what we've got here, we've used basically the metaphor of Polynesian transport technology, which is essentially canoe building technology. So this is a wood rig pegged and lashed in the same way that a large canoe might be lashed. The cross beams act almost as balance beams on an outrigger canoe. Polynesians made wooden ladders to aid in carrying canoes up on shore. The cross beams of this ladder are lashed onto long rails, just like the rollers lashed to the sled for the Moai. What we've done is
is we've taken the canoe ladder concept, which is essentially rails and cross beams with the moai lash to the cross beams. And we've just used exactly that technology, the canoe ladder, cross beams, rails. And it works like a charm. Each group of statues was raised on a long rectangular platform, or ahu. According to island belief, the ahu elevate the ancestral spirits partway between earth and sky. Most ahu platforms are along the coast. The moai face inland, their backs to the sea. To have the Moai facing inland on its ahu, the team resorts to modern machinery. Now they have to reposition the statue face down and then rotate it 180 degrees. Vince explains why. Well, everybody agrees, I think, that the Moai were, were quarried up on the side of the cliffs and were lowered down to the bottom of the slope facing out towards the ocean. And likewise, everybody seems to agree that once they got erected on the Ahu out at the seacoast, they were facing inland away from the ocean. So that means that there's one movement that you can't avoid making, regardless of what transport method you use. Uh, Claudio thinks that the, the uh, sled was fastened to the face of the Moai at the bottom of the quarry slope, and then the whole rig was lowered onto the ground for transport across the island. And if he's right about that, of course, it means that the Moai was handled face down instead of face up. But whether he's right about it or not, somewhere between the bottom of the quarry slope and the Ahu platform, this moai has to be rotated 180 degrees so that once it's erected on the Ahu, it's facing inland away from the sea. Now repositioned face down, the moai is rotated, but not with the tools of the ancients. Uh, you'll notice that the A-frame is now backwards from the way it was yesterday which they did with a crane, but I mean, doing it uh, with manpower would be somewhat of a project. It's just a shame to see all the tricky parts done with the crane, because pulling it on the level is, uh, is not easy, but it's the easiest of all the moves you have to make. And that's the one we're getting to see. It'd be interesting to see the others tried by hand, because I think it'd be a major operation. Vince wonders how the islanders move the giant statues up to the Ahu platforms that line the coast. He doubts Joanne's pulling method, since there is no space for long lines of people on ropes behind the high Ahu platforms. As we've seen, many of these platforms are right on the shoreline, and this is actually water out here. This is actually ocean crashing against the bottom of this wall. We have no other way to move it except long lines of pullers out here. There's no place for these pullers to work. They're all down here in the, in the water swimming. And we need some other way to get this sled up onto the platform. So watching that, it occurred to me that an improvement on this design that solves that problem would be a sled which has lots of crossbars on it so that you have many places to apply leverage. And that would, for example, enable you to get this sled up onto the platform here just using levers and therefore nobody would be swimming out in the ocean. And incidentally, this sled works real well for the 180 degree rotation, which we've seen has to be done somewhere between the, the quarry and the uh, Ahu platform. If all the guys on one side lever forward and all the guys on the other side lever back, as you can see, it quite readily rotates the sled the 180 degrees. Vince has been given one day a half-carved stone of Raphael's and a few leftover materials to put his new idea to practice. His sled is designed for levering a moai forward when there is no room for long lines of people pulling on ropes. The lever is probably one of the first tools that primitive people learned how to use. It was really the only way they had to multiply the force of an individual person's muscle power. The cross beams act as leverage points for the men to push against. Okay, what we're trying to do now is just demonstrate rotating the, the moai on, uh, on, a, on this sled. 
and by putting sl uh, skids oh, under oh my. and having the people on one side go to the rear, the people on the other side go to the front, and the people in front oh and back go to each side, as you see, we can rotate. Oh okay. Well, I think it's, a, it's an interesting experiment. Uh, the main problem we have here is that certainly the frame was, you know, built without knowing the weight of the, of the block. So certainly we have a problem there. It's tending to bend a lot. And that's it's not because the method doesn't work, it's simply because it was not carefully, you know, designed for that block of rock. The bottom line here is it's not really demonstrating very much because the design of the frame is so inadequate that we can't really make a just extrapolation from what we're seeing. We, you know, we are moving it with 14 guys, and it's a big rock, and I, I could hardly claim that it's a, because of that that it's a su successful experiment. What, what we've learned a whole lot of stuff, and I think we've shown that a, a small gang of people with levers can move a big rock. You know, one thing that's kind of neat here, if you figure this thing weighs about six tons, we got 12 guys on it now, so each guy is moving 500 pounds of rock right now. Each individual man. It's not too, not too bad. Um, I would say that to, to turn the moai on the frame we designed doesn't require the intricate ladder that we have here. We could have done it in a simpler way. Vince's side experiment is beginning to raise the temperature and turn the archaeologists and engineers from critics to advocates of their own theories. Having three beams uh, for rotation, uh -huh. the A-frame was just as fine, as good for, for, for the rotation part. Did it's you do a rotation better. with the A-frame? We didn't, but no. we could. Uh -huh. We could, yeah, we but didn't. you didn't. We no. didn't. We didn't. You used a crane for it, if I recall correctly. <laughs> we did right? exactly what the experiment required. Well, it may no, be. It's, okay, I'm it's, just okay. saying, it's easy no. to say it's perfect no, no, for it, no, but no, if you don't no, do it, you no, know. I, I, I said this was perfect last night, but no. now I've done it, and I say, whoops. Maybe now you I say it's be... not only not perfect, no, then, it's a mess. Yes, look at it. Yeah. Look no, no, at no, that. No, That's a disaster. Let's not tear down anything. I'm just looking at the principles. The principles are real. Whenever. And by the way, I'd like to correct to show you how poor an engineer I am. I'd like to correct a comment I made a moment moment ago on camera. I said each of these men was moving 500 pounds. If that's a six-ton rock, each man is moving 1,000 pounds. Now, you can call it poorly designed if you want, but you have 40 people to move nine tons. I've got 12 people moving six tons. You, you didn't do that. You've yeah. got 12 people turning six tons. Well, we moved it, too. You saw it. You saw it move. You know, you saw it move? I did. Yeah. You're right. I saw it move. Congratulations. Well, sure. Could similar arguments have divided the ancient stone movers? trying to move an 80-ton rock, you better make most use of your people. And did the early islanders fight over the politics of moving sacred stone? During the 1600s, life on Easter Island was in crisis. The island had become overpopulated with thousands of people, all competing for the dwindling supply of food. Warfare broke out. And in the ensuing power struggle, there was growing rivalry to carve larger statues to appropriate the spiritual power of Mana. I mean, the whole society embarked in this religious sculptural compassion, reducing the amount of people that was actually producing food, for example, creating some sort of imbalance that uh, at, at the very end led to a crisis and to the collapse of the whole culture. Resources were quickly disappearing. The last precious trees were cut down as the demand for timber to raise and transport moai escalated. Ancestral statues were knocked down by the warring factions. In time, the population would all but disappear. The great civilization of Easter Island had collapsed. A fallen Moai lies beside a stone ramp leading to an Ahu platform. Claudio walks along the back wall. This Ahu, abandoned in mid-construction, shows how the islanders moved their Moai onto the elevated platforms. The main device that was used to lift statues was a stone ramp. 
Ramps were made from the limitless supply of lava rock scattered all over the island. Ascending the stone incline, a moai would finally arrive at its high pedestal stone, which often overlooked the sea. This statue was going to be placed and that ajo using the ramp just described. And we know that the process was never finished because the eye sockets were never open. Moais are completely finished at the quarry several miles from here, except for the eye sockets, which were open when the moai was erected on top of the ajo. At that very moment, it became alive and acquired the supernatural power and the ability to communicate to the ancestral world. At the beginning of another day of testing Joanne's Moai transport theories, Vince surveys the ramp that was made for the experiments. So, Claudio, the way I get it, the platform out at the end where those guys are standing yeah. is what remains after the project, but this is just a construction ramp, is that right? Most probably, the statues were approached to the platforms using this run. Sure, because in most cases, you can't get to the platform from the rear anyway because of the sea walls and so forth. Yeah, they're very close to the coast. Sure. And most of them have very high uh, back walls. Gotcha. Uh -huh. Seaside walls. Right. So most probably... Today's goal will be to transport the Moai up the ramp, which is paved with laterally placed logs. <laughs> They start on flat terrain in front of the ramp. More logs are brought in and placed in position like the ties of a trackless railroad bed. It takes a lot of trees to make a wood road just 30 yards in length. It seems plausible that the trees of the island could disappear altogether in the act of moving sacred stone. Thick palm forests blanketed the island when the first settlers arrived. Pollen analysis shows that a species of palm, strong enough to move moai, called Jubea chilensis, once flourished here. In their escalating efforts to move and raise giant statues, the islanders cut down the last of their trees. Long before the first Europeans arrived in 1726, the island had been stripped bare. Not one Jubea chilensis palm tree remains today. Could it have been the obsession with erecting giant statues that led to Easter Island's ecological and social catastrophe? The next day, the team faces the challenge of moving the Moai the last six feet to the pedestal stone. Joanne's team will now test a different method that gives extra mechanical advantage to the Moai movers. The team has been reduced to 20 people. They've actually done something quite clever here. What they've done now is they've tied the rope from the sled to a lever, a big lever beam, and they've got a big crew over here pulling the lever beam with a rope attached much higher on the pole. And the reason that's so smart is because they get a huge mechanical advantage. In order to move the sled one foot here, they'll have to pull four feet here, but they'll pull with four times the force. So in effect, it's like quadrupling the number of people pulling on the load. So as they pull the pullers back here, they, they basically have four times the force working on the sled by doing it this way. <laughs> Yeah. 
It's a good method. We needed a stronger method. I was waiting for something to break. Well, we were so all we waiting can learn for from it. it. We were all waiting for that. It was we got good. It here, so. With a smaller workforce, it has taken an entire day to move the final six feet. The last few days of experiments have led Joanne to conclude that there may have been more than one method for moving Moai. I have learned that the statues lend themselves very well to manipulation. They're well balanced, they're well designed, you can attach rigs to them, you can change them. I think people would think on their feet and develop methods for moving these statues that were adapted to each individual statue. Many Moai on Easter Island had top knots known as pukao placed on their heads. They are thought to signify the headdresses that Rapa Nui chiefs wore. Red cylindrical pukao lie near the fallen Moai all over the island, and they were carved from this ancient quarry of red scoria stone. Raphael carves an authentic pukao for the replica Moai. He uses a basalt toki, the tool used by the ancient sculptors to carve island stone. Raphael passes on the age-old technique to Santi. Raphael says it is uh, the scoria rug which is used to make the pukao because uh, it is light and people are able to take this uh, pukao across the island to different sites and place it on top of the moai. Rapa Nui society supported specialist craftsmen. The master carvers held an elevated status in the community. So there were master carvers who were dedicated to just carve pukaos. They never work with the rush of time. There was no time frame. It's all based on mana and uh, religion. And in our modern time, we'll succeed, I think. The team must now figure out how to raise the moai. They use levers to lift the load inch by inch, while stones are carefully placed underneath. Slowly, the moai will be jacked up to a vertical position. The pukao is now ready to be added to the load. Not all moai had pukao, and we don't know how the islanders raised them onto the statues. The Rapa Nui men devise a simple pulley system for rolling the one-ton pukao up the short ramp. Pukao and Moai will now be joined together by rope and secured for the raising. Tomorrow we'll see them levering it up, how easy it really is, and uh, it should go very quickly. I think this way it was done. I'm not sure. I mean, it's also pos it's possible to uh, raise the two together, but it's also possible to raise the statue first, and then if the statue is deserving of a pukau, maybe then they put the pukau uh, second. But the problem is when you, yeah. when you do the statue and then do the pukau, you have to do everything twice. This took days, and then you have two more days of doing it. Claudio is the archaeologist in charge of the raising. He hopes the Moai will be raised in one day. By 3 o'clock, it's going to be very high, but 4 o'clock, it should be up. 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock. It's not a promise. <laughs> so now those, those logs now are not... The work takes on its own rhythm, and a steady stream of ideas come from the onlooking experts. Three point at least. I mean, the wood is helping. It's in well, it's in good position. Anyone? 
The pile of rocks jacking up the Moai gradually grows higher. Zvi measures the team's progress by calculating the Moai's angle of incline. 30? Exactly 30. You're off. How much? We're going to go with about uh, 34. Oh. What's if you take the angle of the bike? The they are using the same instrument, but somehow cannot agree on the angle. It's pointing exactly at 30. What am I approximate? It's exactly 30. We got about 31 degrees and 24 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Now really move. From about 30 degrees, we're now approaching probably 40. And at 45, it will be much lighter. So now it's really going to go up very fast. Thirty-five, went up five degrees. The statue of the frame. I, I, I go by the frame. No, and I go for, by the statue because go. the angle is different. I'm reading about a little bit over 40, maybe 42. But pretty soon, one more time, we'll be up at 45. Hey! Hey! Well, I gather from uh, Svi here that it's about uh, 43 degrees now. You know, mathematically, once it gets beyond 45 degrees, it should get easier rather than more difficult. You know, the, so getting, in, getting to here has been the hard part. And as you get nearer and nearer to vertical and you have less and less weight on the rock pile, that's when it, it gets quite easy to set the stone upright, but it's hard to control because you don't have the friction of the load leaning against the rock pile. With a growing rock pile to clamber over, the men find the work tricky and the Moai unstable. Zvi becomes even more interested in their rate of progress. There are now fewer levering positions on the 12 foot pile of rocks for the 20 man workforce. They must all find a place on just three levers. And with the daylight fading, the work will have to continue in the morning. My, my biggest concern now is that uh, because we're running out of light, and it's, it's quite late, uh, and the Moai moved a little bit to, to, to the right, and we have to be very careful because that's the critical angle. We might lose the statue. So we have to secure everything tomorrow, put it straight, and control these rocks around it so that the people will work safely at the same time. But it will, it will happen. I mean, it's, it's not a problem. That's just a little, little uh, disruption in the, in the general process. But uh, it's going to go up, no problem. Two movements, it should be up, but we have to go very slowly because it can, just can come with all the ways this way. But certainly, this is, is the very, the most critical point. Mm. Sixty-one, approximately. The work is soon stopped. Zvi's obsession with the angle gets beyond Claudio's patience. If this is 65... 65 degrees put reference to that, to what? The 65 degrees is the, the angle of the uh, base relative to the horizontal, to the horizon. I mean, you mean this angle here? Yes. yes. That's 65? Yes. No way. That, that's not even 45. I don't know what you're talking about. 
Oh, not right. 65 degrees this way. Come on. I'm measuring this angle here. I mean, no, I, I'm tired of this bullshit. It is a simple misunderstanding. Shit. Great efforts will often bring out great passions. Time, effort, and resources are all at play in this arena of larger-than-life stone moving. It is a delicate moment. It must be played out with brute force. Claudio and Raphael watch for signs of twisting. We may never know how the Moai were moved or raised, but by a revealing stroke of fate, the methods tested here have taught us as much about ourselves as about the ancient Rapa Nui. After all this fighting and all that. It took a lot of headbutting and arguing and compromise, but it's a very creative process. It's a process that probably they went through in part in the ancient times. Woo! Woo! The bottom line is we will never be able to reconstruct with total authority exactly how they did. Yeah. We learned a lot here, I think, through the process of trial and error. I mean, we tried a lot of things. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. Even using a crane for some of the difficult moves, this was not an easy process. I came here with a process in my head that I was going to try something, and I'm going away with more questions than answers, as I always do. But it wasn't until I saw all the people lay hands on this statue, which started out as nothing more than a cement piece, did I understand fully what it means for a statue to take on cumulative history of all of our efforts. All the power of the, of the carvers, all the power of the masters who moved these things, they became the families they represented. Next week on Secrets of Lost Empires, they were gathering places to eat, drink, and gossip, social centers of the Roman Empire, and the most technologically advanced buildings of the ancient world. How do they work? The Roman bath. Explore the sacred sites. See the Moai up close. The Easter Island adventure continues on Nova's website. To order The Secrets of Lost Empires 5 video set with a free family activity book, please call WGBH Boston Video at 1-800-255-9424. The family activity book is also available separately for shipping and handling only. A grim discovery, a 9,000-year-old skeleton rewrites our history. The mystery of the first American, next on NOVA. is a production of WGBH Boston.